blessings that you give us. We ask God that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us today. Father, we welcome our guests into this building. We welcome anybody who's been here before. Welcome home. Welcome back. We thank you, Father, for new friends. And Father, we just ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' name. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, let's sing it out. You take, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Last time, you take. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. So I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on, let's start.
Let's sing this out. The weapon may be formed. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Because when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. Come on, let's sing it out. My God. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see. I'm going to see a victory. Come on, sing it out. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on, guys. Come on, let's sing this out. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's go. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. And every war he wages, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any giant. Because I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. Because I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on, you, you take. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, let's sing that out. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. One more time. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm going to see. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You are my champion. Giants for with you stand undefeated. Every battle. Still got a reason to praise, praise, praise. I still got a reason to praise. Come on, let's stay there. Praise, praise. I still got a reason. 
tend to praise, praise, praise. I've still got a reason to praise. You were the word at the beginning. One with God is the Lord most high. You're here. Hallelujah. In that synagogue, our brothers and sisters were crying out the name Hashem. Adonai, God with us. The Lord is a strong tower and we will run into it. And they were crying out because that man who had an agenda had nothing to lose. He had already decided he was going to die. So what's taking four more lives? But the name of Jesus and people around the world, Christians praying for our brothers and sisters, tore down that wicked, sinful, 
at. Let's praise that out. Hallelujah. What a powerful name. So many names of God. So many names of God. Who is God to you today? Are you needing him, needing him as Jehovah Rapha, your healer? Are you needing him as Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides for you, the one who gives you eyes to see his provision? Are you needing, call out the name of God, who he is to you today. Who is he? Let's exalt his name. He's El Shaddai. He's what else? Our Savior. Who else is he to you today? He's your friend. He's our comforter in the midst of all that we're walking through. What a powerful name, the name of Jesus. Cause you have no rival, you have no equal. Come on, let's sing. Now and forever, God, you reign. You reign over all. Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ my What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Y'all give him some praise this morning. Come on, give him some praise like he's worthy. Give him some praise like he's worthy. Chris and Emily's baby is scheduled to come home this week. Isn't that awesome? But you need to pray for them because they've been diagnosed with COVID. So. Anyway, that's where they are. Today was going to be a very special day here. We were going to lay hands on them to send them out to minister. Chris has been a member here since the sixth grade, involved in ministry, is on staff the last couple years as ministry's assistant and communications coordinator, and he has just been hired, he and his wife, youth pastors of the Bridge Church out on 51. Chris and Emily visited them last Sunday. They all loved each other, and it's going to happen. This was going to be their last Sunday with us, and we were going to pray for them because they're leaving. <laughs> So can we just extend our hand toward the screen, towards their picture? Lord, we just thank you, God, for this great couple. Emily's been with us for over two years. Lord, we just pray for your blessing upon them, upon their health, upon them having their baby in their home, and upon their new ministry venture, as well as the business they're starting. Lord, I pray that you'd bless them in every way for their labors here. Lord, I see their fingerprints all over the place in our foyer, especially. Lord, we just thank you for this couple. Pray, Lord, for unprecedented blessings upon them. Bless their finances. Bless their ministry. Lord, bless our city. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You're love. Can we tell them? One, two, three. You're loved. You're loved. Speaking of praying and sending people out, four years ago we sent this guy out. Shake Anderson. I was our worship pastor for eight years and we laid hands on him four years ago. He's coming back for a night of worship two weeks from today in this very room. At 6 o'clock will be a night of worship with our praise team and then Pastor Shake and whoever he brings with him. It's going to be an awesome time of music and giving praise to God. We are looking at the book of Hebrews in this season. We learned last week that no one really knows for sure who wrote it. One theory is Apollos wrote it. He was an associate of, of the apostles at that time, and he was well-learned in Judaism. And Aquila and Priscilla, 
actually often it's listed as Priscilla and Aquila, took him aside and taught him the ways of the Lord more thoroughly. So some think they wrote it, maybe Priscilla did it. (gasps) A woman who would have known. Some think Paul wrote it because the sentences in it can get really long. And refers to Timothy, but Timothy knew other leaders as well. And one theory is Paul wrote it in Hebrew, and someone more scholarly than Paul in Greek wrote it in Greek. It's a higher level Greek than what Paul normally wrote with. It's the same type of Greek that Luke wrote his Gospel of Jesus as well as the book of Acts. But beside the point, it is a book in the Bible that was chosen by our leaders centuries before us to be a helpful book. It was written for Hebrew Christians, for Jewish believers, followers of Yeshua as the Messiah, to encourage them to stay strong in the faith. It relates a lot to what happens in the Old Covenant and the Old Covenant faith and how it relates to the New Covenant or the Better Covenant is what the book calls it. And so we're going to start with verse 5, but I really want to segue to verse 5. So let's go to the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 1. He opens, or she opens, the writer opens, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. All right? Then chapter 1 goes into how the Son of God is above the angels. There was a theory at that time that Jesus wasn't the Son of God, but he was an amazing person who was actually an angel. But he's above the angels. All right, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, since Jesus is the Son of God and he's above the angels, therefore we must give them more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels prove steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receive the just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So that opens our subject matter. That if Jesus is greater than angels, and that the angels' words were so important that if people in the Old Testament did not heed them, there were consequences, how much greater is it to heed the words of Jesus who's higher than the angels? See the point the writer's making? Verse 5, here we go. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place saying, and he quotes from, the writer quotes from Psalm 8, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. End quote. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see all things put under him. What do we see? We see Jesus. If you could, just turning your Bibles to Psalm 8, reminds me of Genesis 126. God says, let us make man in our image and let us make man male and female. There's no room for confusion there. Can I get an amen? And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, over the beasts of the field, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Dominion over the creeps. He gave us dominion. Psalm 8. 
O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength or praise because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? That's what he's quoting there in Hebrews 2. When I look at all these awesome things that God is worthy of praise for, and then I look at us, who are we? What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you made him a little lower than the angels. So we are lower than angels. Jesus is above angels. We are lower than angels. They have more power. They're eternal creatures. Uh, We have things they don't have. We have redemption. We have opportunities to be saved. They, if they rebel, it's all over for them. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Now you can read this and understand this to have been our destiny, but because of sin, it's not the case. So it's our prophetic destiny. But you can understand it to be the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he ends with, oh Lord, how excellent is your name. How excellent is your name that you have made your son to have dominion over us. So the book of Hebrews is talking about Jesus. For in that he put all in subjection under him, verse 8, he left nothing that is not put under him. Everything in natural creation was put under man's authority. Can I get an amen? Amen. But now we do not see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. What? I thought he was above the angels. Yes, that was the case made in chapter 1. But chapter 2, he humbled himself. He made himself. The Father made him lower than the angels. He became human. Why? For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The word their captain could be translated pioneer or author. He is the Lord of salvation. Can somebody say yes? yes? So how was he made complete through suffering? He took our place. He became lower than the angels. And he paid the penalty for sin, which was death. The dominion we had died when our forefather rebelled against the Lord's command. So he's made perfect or complete through sufferings. Verse 11, for both he who sanctifies, that is to make holy or to set apart, and those who are being sanctified, that is to be made holy or set apart, are all of one. He's the one that sanctifies us. We're the ones that he sanctified. You see that? So he became one with us. Not with our sin, but with our humanity. Is that clear? He became human, the incarnation. The word of God has always been, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That's the first chapter of John's gospel. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason... He is not ashamed to call them brethren. Some people have brothers they're ashamed of. Remember Jimmy Carter's brother, Billy? Has anybody drank some Billy beer? 
I have two brothers I love dearly. I'm not ashamed of them. Hopefully they're not of me. But the Lord of glory compared to us became one of us and he's not embarrassed by us. Isn't that pretty awesome? He's, he's, yeah, it's a lot of grace. <laughs> Some people struggle to relate to God as their father because they had a bad experience with a father. And so in the healing of their soul, they embrace God the Father more than, than other people who had a great father. But it's with great difficulty sometimes. Some people maybe had a horrible sibling. Are you with me, Cinderella? <laughs> the Lord Jesus is your sibling. He made himself our brother. Saying, and he quotes from Psalm 22, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, and he quotes from Isaiah 8, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Here am I and the children God has given me. Here am I and my brothers and sisters. Have you ever been embarrassed by relatives? He was a well-known pastor in the denomination I grew up in. He actually became their general superintendent over time, but he pastored for years in Indianapolis, Calvary Pentecostal Church. And one day, walking down the street with some other pastors from other denominations, some dignified guys, uh, he was approached by a member of his church. Hi, Brother Ushad, how you doing? A person that had some impairments. And uh, he greeted the person warmly. And the other brothers chuckled. <laughs> member of your church, huh? <laughs> he said, yes, we welcome everybody. I thought it was hilarious. He said, yes, we welcome everybody. Sorry, never mind. Whew, no jokes today. It's a true story, though. I'd like to speak to you for the next few minutes on our brotherhood with Jesus. But I would like to go to Psalm 22, because the impact of... That verse, verse 12, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. The impact is driven home by that psalm. It is a lament. A lament in the Bible is like the blues that ends on a high note. It's not just whining, 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 but it's telling it like it really is and then the Lord at that point of honesty brings revelation. Job had that. And he should have stopped right there with that epiphany and just became repetitious with it. Because his friends weren't stopping, but he had the sword and he dropped it because they just were relentless at him. And then he got into error on his part. The Lord rebuked him, the Lord restored him. But here was the sword. He's whining his case. My wife can't stand my breath. Little children run from me. Woe is me. And then the epiphany came. He said, I wish these next words were written on stone with an iron pen. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And in my flesh, I shall see God. End of sentence. Case closed. He didn't know how redemption was going to come. He knew things were bad. He was being honest with the Lord. And the Lord gave him faith. Faith comes from the word, right? The Lord gave him a word to use like a sword. I don't know how redemption is going to come, but I know the Redeemer lives. We may not know how healing is going to come, but we know the healer lives. You may not know how restoration is going to come, but rest assured, the restorer lives. Does that make sense? So in the depths of your despair, be honest with the Lord. We, we don't believe in faking it till we start making it. 
but we faith it till we make it. So in your despair, be honest with the Lord. Don't tell him, I don't have a cold. I have a cold. (laughs) And I need some help. Tell him just how you feel, how it all is, and wait before him. Just don't go into a rant and raving and not listening. And he will bring a promise to you. Hold on to that promise. When discouragement comes, just repeat it. The enemy of your soul is not very creative, but he is relentless. And the weapon that beat him yesterday is the same weapon that will beat him tomorrow. Well, it must not have worked. Here's the devil again. Well, what worked? What worked? Well, he's back. Well, you're hungry again, right? Did the meal you ate not work? Right? Hunger is persistent. It will return, right? Thirst is persistent. It will return. So food and drink is a constant. Getting sleepy. Well, it must not have worked. I'm sleepy again. Well, you worked yesterday. So that weapon the Lord gives you is like a sword in your mouth. Speak it again when you need to, to yourself and to other discouraged folks and to the thoughts and the enemy of your soul. That's how to walk in victory. That's the sword of the Spirit. So here, prophetically, the Lord in Psalm 22 is on the cross. Yes, that wonderful Psalm 23 is preceded by this horrible psalm. But if you look at that in context of this, the Lord is our shepherd. He's gone through hell for me. It opens with verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? You can almost hear a harmonica and a slide guitar. Why are things so bad? I don't mean to belittle the Lord's suffering. Verse 7, those who see me, if you had time to study these, it it gives an amazing picture of what he went through. Those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Remember what they said to him? If you're the son of God, get yourself down off the cross. Oh, you're still there, are you? Must not be the son of God. Call on your father. They're mocking him, right? Verse 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. The latter part of verse 16. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. So he's naked. He's stretched out. He can look down and see his ribs. This is what he's experiencing on the cross for us. David, I don't know what he was going through when he wrote this, but he was having a tough time himself. They divide, verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Remember? They took Jesus' clothes and separated them from each other. He must have had a backpack or a suitcase or something that they took and separated, but there was a seamless robe that they didn't want to tear, and so they gambled for it. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. So he's in the pits of of despair. The latter part of verse 21 comes the epiphany. It comes the sword. It comes the encouragement. You have answered me. You know, no matter what we're going through, if we know the Lord has heard our prayer, That in itself takes away a whole lot of the struggle, right? I will declare your name to my brethren. 
in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. The word there for assembly is the word kalal. It means congregation. The word there for praise is halal. In the kalal, I will halal. Halal means to be clear, to, to make your praises clear. So here I am suffering, but God has answered me, and I will. I'm going to rise up from this. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. Verse 25, my praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. All the ends of the earth, verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. The question of the ages is who are you going to worship? Jesus wants to join in with your worship. He was encouraged on the cross, I am going to praise you in the middle of my brothers. A brotherhood with Jesus is spoken of in Romans 8. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn or the first begotten among many brothers. So we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And everything in our life is working towards that end. A lot of people fight over this verse. Some try to diminish it and explain it away. Some try to make it more than what it is. The point is they're ignoring the fact. It's talking about being made like Jesus. That's more than just going to heaven. That's being a witness for him here. If we all go to heaven and we're not like Jesus, heaven's going to become earth too. A bunch of self-centered folks fighting over the borders between their mansions. I went too far there, sorry. <laughs> a brotherhood with Jesus that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Mankind was made lower than angels, but had authority over all natural creation. So we were lower than angels, but we had authority over everything else below them. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. This was us. This was our condition. But right now it's just prophetic. Death is not under our feet. It's still a reality. It's under the feet of Jesus. Having lost authority, now death reigns. For in that he put all in subjection under him, capital H, little h, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see all things put under him. Have anybody been to a funeral for a believer? That is indication death is still a reality. The never die doctrine is a false doctrine. <laughs> Have you heard of the never die doctrine? If you never sin, then you're never going to die. We had some people in town that believed that. They must have sinned because eventually they died. <laughs> Jesus, greater than angels, made lower than angels, tasted death for everyone. He took the sentence, death to our dominion that left us in the state that we are is dominion that he restores we see Jesus. We don't see these things under our feet, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every one. For him, it was just a taste. Three days later, he arose. I'm glad that meal's over. He left his napkin folded Remember in the tomb? Permanently securing the way for you and I 
to experience eternal life, one day death being under our feet. Suffering for us, he became our brother. For it was fitting for him, verse 10, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain or the author or pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So it had to happen for us. He became the last Adam to undo the evil of the first Adam. For both he who sanctifies, that's Jesus, and those who are being sanctified, that's us, are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He became one of us so that he could die for us. Being God, he could not die. But being human, he could. But it, would, it could only be temporary because life is his portion. He's God, right? And he had no sin. So he took the place of sin to die for us so that we could be freed from the fear of death. As brothers, we will sing praise with him. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. Verse 13, I will put my trust in him. Here am I and the children whom God has given me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. So we've looked at that in the context of the suffering of Jesus on the cross and this epiphany that happens in the face of that horror. And we see the contrast. We see the faith in it. But what does it mean? In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise with my brothers, my sisters. Don't let the gender thing in the Bible mess you up. When it's talking about mankind, it's all of us, right? Corporately, we are the bride of Christ, all of us, men and women. We're not the brides of Christ. We are the bride of Christ, right? Corporately, we are the body of Christ, right? Not individually. I'm not the body of Christ. I'm part of the body of Christ. But corporately, the church and the earth is the body of Christ, right? Individually, we are the sons and daughters of God. But ladies, individually, you're a son of God. We are the sons of God. You have the rights and privileges of a son. No primitive culture here. We are all the sons of God, corporately and individually. I know that sounds weird, but just, I like to call myself a daughter of a king. That's fine. You are the daughter of the king. That is biblical. But you have all the privileges of being a son. Therefore, we're all the brothers of Jesus or siblings of Jesus, however you want to look at it. Back to the point. When does Jesus sing with us? Well, could be when worship reaches the throne of God, the Lord who's at the right hand of God is joining in. Maybe when Paul and Silas were in the Philippian jail, he patted his foot just a little too much. <laughs> Maybe through the presence of the Holy Spirit, he is with us, singing with us. I have been in services where there's an extra dimension to the worship. It's like it's beyond the harmony, beyond the skill. It's just something there, a synergy taking place. Could that be the Lord with us? Could be. Could be. Could it be the work that He has done to purchase our salvation has played on our heartstrings and we sing? Just like a musician strumming a guitar or playing a keyboard, the song in their heart flows through the instrument. Lord, make us your instruments flow through us. The work he has done for us is awesome. Larry Norman wrote a song that back during the days of the Jesus movement, in the 70s, it was quite controversial because the Jesus people were using drums and electric guitars. But this is one song that came from the Jesus people that the Southern Gospel crowd picked up. It's called Sweet, Sweet Song of Salvation. When you know a pretty story, you don't let it go unsaid. You tell it to your children as you tuck them into bed. When you know a wonderful secret, you got to tell it to all of your friends. 
Tell him that a lifetime filled with happiness is like a street that never ends. Well, look around you as you're singing. There are people everywhere. And to those who stop and listen, that sweet song becomes a prayer. When you know a wonderful secret, you got to tell it to all your friends. Tell them that a lifetime filled with Jesus is a street that never ends. And the chorus is, sing that sweet, sweet song of salvation and let your laughter fill the air. Sing that sweet, sweet song of salvation and tell the people everywhere. Sing that sweet, sweet song of salvation to every man and every nation. Sing that sweet, sweet song of salvation and let the people know that Jesus cares. He saved us. It puts a song in our hearts, right? If a songwriter writes a song like, A mighty fortress is our God. Martin Luther got that tune from the secular world and put words to it. And whoever translated it into English did a mighty, mighty deal. So while the songwriters are not present with us, they have done work that keeps the song going, right? So the Lord is singing with us no matter how you look at it. And maybe this video is a metaphor of the work of the Lord. Watch this. This is from Britain's Got Talent. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Nice to meet you. I am so good. <laughs> nice to meet you. What's your name? My name is Patrick George. Patrick George. Yes. Okay. And what's the act, Patrick? I'm a gospel choir. You, you're... Just you? Yes, I'm a choir. Do you have a normal job, Patrick? Yes, I do. What is it? I'm a pastor. A pastor? Yes, I am. <laughs> do you think you could save Simon's soul? Yes. Or do you think he's going straight to hell? <laughs> You'll be driving the bus, dear. <laughs> Back to Patrick. Yeah, That's okay. sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, I can't wait to hear the act. Good. Good luck. One, two, three, four. I open my mouth to the Lord. to say they got four yeses. Lord, we don't know how you sing with us, but we're glad you do. And Lord, we thank you for going through the cross, not calling angels down to do your bidding, to rescue you from saving us from our sin. Lord, we thank you that you went through with the deed. 
You gave your life for us and you left behind proofs of your resurrection. The tomb was empty. Your enemies made sure there could be no fake resurrection. You were killed by professional executioners to make sure you were dead. Thank you, Lord, that you left a group of followers who refused to deny their faith in the resurrection at the face of torture, loss, theft, and even death. Thank you, Lord, you left a church behind. As imperfect as we are, you're not done with us, and you're not ashamed of us. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters that are in this room. Help us, Lord, to sing with you. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we didn't sing and you were singing by yourself. Lord, help us. Help us to grow in that area, to worship you always in the face of discouragement. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. If there's anyone that needs encouragement, Lord, may they not leave here without talking to someone and receiving prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord. reminds me of phone numbers. You know, if you meet someone you want to keep in touch with, you get their number, right? When I met this girl in the front row 44 years ago, I got her number. Amen. 
and her address, right? God has given us his name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whoever calls on that name can be saved. If you find yourself believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he lived on earth and died a death and rose from the dead, you can be saved by calling on his name. Jesus, let's do it. Jesus, I call on your name. I believe in you. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that you lived and died. And you arose from the dead. Forgive me of my sins. I give you my life. It's like that. It's that simple. Do it. Do it. Do it. Well, do I have to do it publicly? No, you don't. Water baptism is public. So we don't baptize people in closets. So if you find yourself becoming a believer, having prayed like that, come to us. The Lord will put a desire in your heart to be baptized. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Worshiping with Jesus today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Go get them, tigers.